Hello? Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I believe we all have taken our seats and we can officially start. My name is Anya Gengo. I work for the IGF Secretariat and one of my primary responsibility there is to have a pleasure to work with now more than 120 national, regional and youth IGFs or as we call them shortly, the NRIs. The NRIs work throughout the year on a number of objectives. One of them is the organization of the main session every year <clears throat> since 2016. I have to apologize for my voice. I don't sound very pleasant this morning, but at least I project something this morning. And I don't uh, think you will be listening to my voice mostly. The majority of the colleagues here will be taking the, the time uh, until 11 o'clock this morning. I have a pleasure that next to me is my online co-moderator, Mr. Ms. Liana Galstian from the Armenian IGF and also the Southeastern European IGF. We are also very thankful for um, the help of our two rapporteurs for ha helping to write a report of this very complex session, I can tell that in advance given the number of speakers and the differences on the topic that exists ac across countries and regions. Uh, Mr. Tracy Hackshaw from Trinidad and Tobago IGF and uh, Mr. Joshua Joshua from the West African Youth IGF are on my right side. They will be helping us to report on this session, of course, in communication and in um, agreement with all the session organizers of this session. I have to recognize also a very unfortunate fact this morning. As you know, throughout the year, we have endorsed two co-moderators for this session. So one was uh, me and another one was Ms. Marilyn Cade. I think the majority of you probably know Ms. Uh, Cade. She has been a co-coordinator of the National US IGF. But aside of that, during her time on the MAG, she was helping to strengthen the NRI's network, which resulted in a great success. Unfortunately, Marilyn uh, couldn't join us today due to health. 
um, issues, but she is streaming us. And uh, we are all wishing her a very speedy recovery. But that's uh, why I'm kind of relying on my online moderator mostly, and of course on all the speakers. Before we start with the formal part of this session, which are the exchanges on the topic of emerging technologies, I would like just very, very briefly to tell you who are the NRIs in case there are those that are maybe not familiar with the concept of national and regional IGFs. I hope you can see the presentation that's just behind me. And if we go on the next slide, maybe the most simple wording for all is that the NRIs are the IGFs organized all around the world. We are very happy that we have a network of more than 120 NRIs that are multi-stakeholder, bottom-up, open, transparent, they're non-commercial, inclusive, of course, in organizing their processes on internet governance, but also the annual meeting of their national and regional IGFs, such just like the global IGF. So as I said, we have uh, 100 and, uh, actually 122 as of recently, recognized NRIs with more than uh, 87 countries having successfully running their national IGFs, 17 regional IGFs, 17 youth IGFs, which are extremely important to our ecosystem, and uh, three more countries that we are hoping by the end of December to have also joining our network. On the map that's shown, maybe we can go to the, to the NRIs map, that is showing the geographic overview of all NRIs, you can see that there is a well-balanced spread of the NRIs across the world. That is giving a confidence to the IGF that we are in a position to address the internet governance issues that are very different across countries and regions very successfully. And we are very proud to have a very good communication and collaboration with all the NRIs that are completely independent, they have their autonomy, but there is a good awareness on all sides that if we don't work together, we cannot achieve a lot. With that, I would like to go back then to the topic of the session and formally start this session. The preparation for these sessions started shortly after the 13th IGF in Paris. Through a bottom-up process, all NRIs have identified the topic of emerging technologies to be of interest to everyone, and that is what we are addressing today. Especially, we are looking at the interfaces of emerging technologies on the level of country and region with inclusion, security, and human rights. I am now going to... Um, ask firstly a few of the NRI colleagues to help us to set the stage and make us all aware how the emerging technologies are not evenly spread and present in all countries and regions, how the threats and concerns that we have are different, and how the digital divide is very much present when it comes about the application and utilization of emerging technologies. Every single NRI working in the past uh, 10, 11 months on actively preparing this session, has submitted a written case study input specifically for this session because the goal of this session is to actually show that the emerging technologies are supposed to serve the people and that in some parts of the country they are already serving very successfully people, making a radical transformation of their social, economical, cultural, even political development. Through concrete case studies, we will see how the emerging technologies are impacting people, not exclusive groups, but everyone that have access to it. So with that, I would like to start with probably one of the, um, of the parts of the world that is benefiting now rapidly from introducing the access, connecting more and more countries, and with that bringing new technologies, which is the African continent. We are having today with us Mr. Makan Fai, that's coordinating the African IGF. I'm going to ask Makan to reflect on the diversity of the African continent and how emerging technologies are critical in some parts for improving basic living conditions. Makan, can we hear a word from you? Uh, everyone, thank you, Anya, for giving me the floor. Uh, I'm going an example from the African IGF which was held in Germany, Chad in September 2019. 
and it is about uh, making available information on quality water through internet. Uh, this project uh, was presented by Chad. Uh, according to the joint monitoring program report released by UNICEF and WHO to monitor the SDG targets, 2 billion, 200 million people around the world do not have safely managed drinking water services. This uh, relates to 80 countries in the world and 49% of the world population. This lack of access to clean water is compounded by water-related diseases like cholera, hepatitis, and typhus. For Chad alone, 62% of the population drinks surface water or water from the well. To overcome this situation, a project on access to drinkable and quality water using emerging technologies was uh, put in place. And uh, the project consists of putting in place a central server powered by solar energy in the River Chari in Chad, using ultrasound equipment and drones to gauge the water quality, transmitting the findings through gateways via LoRa's low power wide area wireless data networks and internet to the cloud, analysis of the findings from the server and online consultation and dissemination of the results. The main objective of the project is to assist the governments improve the planning process towards building and digging water wells and drillings and dams, to sensitize, educate, share information with everyone about good water, its availability and consumption, and reduce children uh, deaths through uh, bad water and uh, related diseases. Chad is being used as a testing zone and it is proposed to expand the project in 2023 to other five African countries, in 2024 to another set of six African countries, in 2025 to another set of six other African countries, and in 2026 to four countries of the Middle East and Central Asia. The PowerPoint uh, of the uh, project available at FIGF.Africa website. Thank you. Lakan, thank you very much. And I'm thanking you, uh, firstly, for a very fascinating example, but also with um, sticking with the agreed time of speaking no more than two and a half minutes. And I'm going to ask all colleagues to just uh, uh, take care of that as well, although I'm also timing here. Listening to the Makan was very, very interesting. And you can see how the life of people has been transformed on something that many of us are taking for granted because we have access to clean water. And I would like to now ask Jeff, I think he's with us from the Vanuatu IGF to share the perspectives from this part of the world. Jeff, Vanuatu is a very small island, developing country uh, with uh, beautiful nature and wonderful people for sure, of uh, around 280,000 inhabitants and around more than 120 languages. That's Number of languages can be very important for the utilization of digital technologies, local content, and so on. And I would like to see what are the perspectives coming from the country, and how do you see the application of emerging technologies in Vanuatu? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ania. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this session again. Um, uh, as you've rightly said, Vanuatu is a small Pacific Island country. Um, very small population, uh, but I guess the challenge around that is the spread of island, uh, which is around 83 different islands uh, spread across uh, for Vanuatu. And um, while emerging technologies is uh, currently a buzzword for basically users, uh, the government or organizations um, already facing challenges around the current use of technologies. Uh, as it stands, um, Vanuatu for Vanuatu, the, the first thing that has been the, uh, mainly um, installed or established is the e-government services. And uh, for uh, emerging technologies, we see the introductions of uh, IOTs, the use of drones, blockchain, and at times uh, visiting um, services by, for, in terms of uh, virtual reality and augmented reality in the field of medical, and also um, a bit of AI. But those are very small. Um, at this stage, uh, everything revolves around IoT for Vanuatu and uh, the use of drones mainly. However, I'd like to touch a bit on the benefits, which is uh, pretty much benefits around enhancing business operations uh, when introduced uh, of such technologies. 
and uh, uh, in a sense, affordable technology, enhancing business process. And also, uh, you can also say that the unserved part of the islands can actually gain technology service, especially over uh, mobile smartphones and also um, social media. Social media has been a big part uh, of uh, enhancing uh, services in the country, especially for farmers, and uh, it has a big impact to the people of Vanuatu, especially in the remote areas. However, with benefits, there are also challenges, and I guess the big one is uh, for remote rural areas, emerging technologies can also be a, a, a overwhelming experience or a wow, it comes with a wow factor. Um, in that, having said that, um, there are questions due to how Vanuatu uh, culture and the people of Vanuatu live. Um, privacy is something uh, that is of concern. And also, uh, like many other countries, security is a concern as well. But I'd, I'd like to share an, a use case in terms of emerging technology, which was recently done this year is by an NGO called Oxfam. They've introduced blockchain, a cash card uh, service. Um, it was, uh, I think, it is a joint uh, initiative with the donor partners, Australia, uh, the Australian government. They've introduced that for uh, a support service in terms of disaster recovery. As, as you all know, Vanuatu is ranked number one in terms of disaster recovery. And uh, that service has been uh, through two phases already. The first one, uh, cards were allocated to uh, two communities in, in Port Vila, the capital city. Uh, outskirts and it's up to around uh, 4,000 baht, which is $40 equivalent that can be used in shops and all those things in a time of disaster, disaster recovery. And the second phase of that was used uh, in other outer remote areas uh, of uh, on the island of Tana, uh, which was done uh, a month or two ago. And with such uh, services, we see the both benefits and also the challenges around it. And that is something that for the country, I guess, in a um, government level or higher level, it's something uh, yet to be discussed and a lot of discussion has to go around that. Especially, um, there are existing policies and regulations, but there are some gray areas as well which the country needs to focus on. Thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Jeff. From using the emerging technologies to get a clean water to resist to natural disasters. I would like to move now to completely another part of the world. Let's go to Eastern Europe and see how is the situation in North Macedonia regarding the presence of emerging technologies. Good morning, everyone. First of all, thanks for the invite. And it's a great pleasure for us, especially uh, we are the, a very young uh, forum. And we are a very young um, group established in 2017. Um, and of course, we are representing the Balkan region. Uh, emerging technologies in Macedonia are very widespread, and the usage of um, internet is 70% around the nation. Then also we have mostly uh, people using the mobile phones are accessing like 80% of them, which is quite big for the, such a small country. Subsequently, the emerging technology and the interface are constantly growing in the country, and for this reason we have established the IGF Macedonia, and the annual Internet Governance Forum event was uh, first time introduced in 2017 with the main focus openly to discuss the internet governance issues between all stakeholders. First annual event was addressing the digital identity and diplomacy, digitalization of governance services, cybersecurity methods, and presenting the first Macedonian uh, cybersecurity center of incident response. Uh, MKD cert. Online enforcement, copyrights, fake news, and media literacy. The second one next year in 2018, we discussed the cybersecurity and trusted services by introducing three, three pillars the technical, academical, and government. And then later on this year in October, we emphasize on government action plan against spreading disinformation, followed by the media society discussion, technical community by presenting the high availability of internet connection research platform, and cybersecurity, legal aspects, and human rights. On the whole, we can see that Macedonian IGF, North Macedonian IGF, plays an important role in the country by raising awareness and promoting a better understanding of internet governance among all stakeholders, by highlighting the importance of human rights, 
access to technology and internet, security and privacy. Thank you very much, Predrag, for bringing these um, very interesting perspectives, especially that the focus of North Macedonia is to protect their online end users. Thank you. Um, after North Macedonia, I would like to, for all of us to visit a bit the region of Latin America and the Caribbean and to go to the Dominican Republic, Federica is with us, to see how the digital technologies are impacting people in that country, in that part of the world. Federica, you have the floor. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. In this case, I'm going to speak in Spanish because, well, I imagine it's the principal idioma. Principal. Um, Good morning. I'm going to speak in Spanish as a representative of ISOC and the Dominican Republic. I have to say that the influence of the new technologies is strong in our countries. One example, in traffic and transport, new technologies have been very important and also for accessing new markets. It's been mostly about the fact that in the past, taxi services or taxi drivers offered a bad service and just took um, a random and uh, taxi prices were just random. That has changed uh, with new technologies, but it is still important to assess and analyze the situation properly to see how new technologies impact our lives socially, for example. and. Also, what's important is to assess effects on vulnerable groups of society because, of course, these technologies can build a very good bridge, but they can also have negative effects. One example. In our country, we um, made several efforts because these tech there was a little awareness of uh, these uh, technologies, um, not a very good understanding. And instead of getting us closer to each other and instead of fully benefiting from the advantages of new technologies, we often have been rather divided by technology. I'm talking about very, very high taxes on telecommunications. Today, we are working on reducing this kind of tax. We decided that um, this kind of high tax, or we found that this high tax keeps a um, poorer part of the populations of the Internet. And this is why we've been supporting several projects for two years. So we are getting closer to our objectives. We still want to establish a local group. And we are mostly working on digital literacy because new technologies are very important in education in this day and age. But we also know that we, of course, have to talk about technology, but also address um, other issues. Connectivity is not or cannot always taken for granted in our country, especially in rural regions. So we can work together with the regions, really. We need to make our government understand that we live in a new modern reality now. This is a development that we have to make good use of because it is a positive development for us, especially as a developing country. Thank you very much. Interesting inputs from the uh, Dominican Republic. Just following what Federica said, a very interesting examples, but you mentioned something that's very important, and that is that we're not equal, not even on a local level, like at a level of a country, in terms of ha having access to technologies. 
and some of us are still unrepresented and underrepresented. But not just in technologies, in basic living conditions, we're not even. And I would like to uh, turn to the Italian IGF to see how are they using the digital technologies to improve and balance having access to basic living conditions in the country for everyone. Good morning, and thank you very much for the opportunity to talk in this uh, meeting, very relevant for uh, our national community to be here and represent uh, this very basic problem, which is the availability of food to everyone in every country, even the, let's say, the wealthy and highly developed countries. Uh, we can see also in uh, a very rich city like Berlin that there are many people around us asking for food. I'm not staying in this hotel, I'm in Alexanderplatz, and every morning I travel here, I can see someone asking for something. So distribution of natural resources is a main point. And uh, this was addressed by the African National IGF. Water is another uh, important resource. And uh, food is uh, coming from our natural resource as well and is very related to the availability of water. And um, I'm here in particular to report the results of the, our um, national community, the Italian, that met in uh, Torino one month ago. And one specific issue that we discussed was how the ICT technologies and the emerging technologies might help to improve the distribution and reducing the imbalance of uh, food. Because we are in a very, let's say, unpleasant uh, situation where more people are uh, without food, basic food, and other people waste food. This is a situation quite common all over the world. So how to improve the distribution of the uh, food supply chain. This is uh, a very important point because the food supply chain is a very complex uh, uh, distribution line. And so over the chain, we must ensure that uh, we can get uh, uh, secure and safe food. And uh, we can also ensure worker rights also uh, talking, for example, for the conditions of the workers uh, in our fields. This is a problem for every country, not only for Italy. And uh, other security issues are uh, coming with the new technology also. You may also know that we have riders running around our cities uh, distributing foods to our own. And so the condition of these workers are very insecure. Probably, the, in some cases, they are also exploited. They are not paid and not, they are not provided with security and insurance rights as it should be the case. So in our country, we have a specific initiatives trying to address security and insurance issues, um, and also our social security institutions, the governmental ones, are issuing uh, decrees in this direction and working at creating a national platform for the management of the worker rights in this specific field. So we have the technologies, blockchain technologies, artificial intelligence to manage the distribution of chain, but we also need to have the right regulation in order to avoid that imbalance and unsecure working conditions are in place uh, despite uh, the openness and uh, accessibility of the digital platform. So this is uh, a, um, an aspect that is very, very uh, understood and um, many people are working at the governmental level. And so we hope 
uh, and we are probably, as we know, the first country that is uh, providing a law between the national institution and the local institution, the cities, in order to guarantee the security of the worker and the, the equal distribution of rights. Thank you very much, Professor Anna, for these very interesting examples coming from a country that's considered to be developed but still trying to um, respond to bringing the basic living conditions be equal for everyone. Um, in addition to these ex very interesting examples, I would like us to go back to the um, Latin American region and to one of the biggest countries, well, globally speaking, but also for that region, to Brazil, to see how are they con uh, addressing primarily the use of artificial intelligence in the interconnected systems. Jose Luis is luckily with us today, and he will be telling us more about the nature of the discussions happening at the Brazilian IGF in this regard. Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Hania, for <clears throat> inviting us and, and uh, introducing. The Brazilian IGF is held annually since uh, 2011. In the last two years, the forum held discussions on various themes and tracks, such as privacy and data protection, infrastructure and connectivity, internet governance, ecosystem, multi-stakeholderism, internet jurisdiction, cybersecurity, education and capacity development, human rights, among several others. There were activities approaching the definition of principles and ethical guidelines for AI systems and also dealing with facial recognition technologies and practices. Ethical guidelines and principles for those technologies are hot topics in Brazil given that there are ongoing actions within the Brazilian Congress and the judiciary regarding those issues, as there are several concerns related to AI data collection, analysis and processing, which may conflict with privacy and data protection safeguards. Well-known Brazilian research institutions and groups have been studying the effects of artificial intelligence in web-based systems, with the primary goal of categorizing human beings such as regular image-seeking online services or even tools used by police institutions to fight crime and how this type of systems can impact social interactions in terms of diversity and respect to minorities. Additionally, as crucial discussion topic with broader effects for society in general, the use of artificial intelligence in communication and social interaction systems have been deemed responsible for influencing democratic processes, especially national elections, by the spread of fake news and disinformation. Multiple events and public debates, along with the Brazilian IGF, IGF workshops, have been held in the country in the last two years as a result of a general fear of biased consequences in democratic processes. The Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, CGI.br, for example, has fostered most stakeholders dialogues and has sponsored specific activities that gathered multiple experts and produced concrete outcomes that have been supporting public debate and specific actions by the Brazilian Congress and the government in policy making. It's worth noting a public controversy related to the use of facial recognition by companies and some public services in Brazil. There are different stakeholders understanding Undertaking, undertaking measures in the country with the aim of upholding the rights of Brazilian citizens with regards to the use of those technologies in diverse social contexts. For example, there are consumer protection organizations explicitly using companies that deployed facial recognition technologies, potentially disregarding privacy and other citizens' rights in different areas such as transportation, aviation, and apparel stores. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose Luis, for these interesting um, inputs bringing to this uh, session. Sometimes, indeed, the emerging technologies, when they take a massive turn, are quicker than us. And having that kind of a scientific research approach to researching and seeing what actually people see as a concern, how are they applied, is very important to foresee some other consequences that can come in the future. I think Brazilian example is actually a very good um, practice for all of us to follow. With that, I would like to move uh, further, further north to the American continent 
and uh, Nancy from the Canadian IGF is luckily with us. So I would like ne to ask Nancy to tell us more about the priorities uh, regarding the emerging technologies for the community of the Canadian IGF. Thank you, Anya. Good morning. My name is Nancy Carter, and I have the privilege of chairing the Canadian Internet Governance Forum Steering Committee. One of our priorities in 2019 was responding to security and privacy concerns around consumer Internet of Things, or IoT, devices. The International Data Corporation estimates that in Canada, we now have more than 114 million installed, autonomous, intelligent, and embedded systems, or IoT devices, and this number grows daily. It equates to three IoT devices for every adult and child in the country. The promise of opportunities related to IoT devices and the big data that they produce is very real. However, these opportunities and conveniences come with serious risks. For devices, security or privacy, if it's included, is often designed in after the fact. On the user front, there's no way for users to differentiate between secure devices and insecure ones. Finally, security weaknesses can have severe consequences. Bad actors can compromise sensitive user data and perpetrate harm. These exploitations pose a real threat to users and to the internet as a whole. In Canada, CIRA, the Canadian Internet Registration Authority, has been active with the community in developing a new secure home network framework to protect IoT devices from attacking the internet, and conversely, to protect IoT devices from internet and home attacks. Building on that, the inaugural 2019 Canadian Internet Governance Forum engaged the community with a panel session that focused on creating effective security standards with consistent labeling for IoT devices. The panel discussed the creation of IoT standards and labels to define clear security and privacy capabilities and features for IoT manufacturers. To support user adoption, the panel emphasized the importance of plain language and multilingual educational initiatives, global harmonization, and increased manufacturer transparency. Using a pan-Canadian multi-stakeholder approach, a separate initiative convened by the Internet Society analyzed the challenges in enhancing IoT security posed by consumer IoT devices, and they emerged with four broad recommendations. Focus on international standards. Improve network resiliency. Create consumer-friendly labels. And take a multi-stakeholder approach to consumer education. In order to carry out the recommendations of this group, an implementation working group was formed and will be leveraged to coordinate and contribute to several initiatives, including Canadian participation in international IoT security initiatives. The conclusion from the Canadian IGF's perspective? Multi-stakeholder efforts like the Canadian IGF and the Canadian multi-stakeholder process on IoT security are vital to improving consumer IoT privacy and security. Thank you. And see, thank you very much, firstly, for speaking about standards, which are extremely necessary, but also about the multi-stakeholder approach in approaching the IoTs and how they should serve people and not the other way around. With that, listening from the Canadian IGF, I would like us to go back to the Asian continent. We have a pleasure to have Mr. Yoon Chang Chung with us from the South Korean IGF that is going to tell us what are the priorities for the South Korea in terms of the utilization of emerging technologies. Okay, it's a pleasure to introduce South Korea's uh, effort in terms of emerging technology development. As a, uh, one of the most tech-shabby country of the world, South Korea uh, was right input to some kind of uh, already uh, has a lot of e effort to enhance security and the human life protection. In, uh, uh, on, the, on the same time, we developed also emerging technology. So, okay, in January uh, 19, in uh, January of 2019, South Korea government announced a national plan to foster data-driven AI economy. This is a very important terminology. It articulates the future vision of the safety country that makes the most of the value of data and AI together. Uh, to, to prepare the future impact of AI, South Korea has, has a three approaches. First of all, we launched 
uh, AI Open Innovation Hub. This is uh, uh, integrated platform to provide the open data, which is anonymized and synonymized. This is very important resources for the AI tech companies and the software companies and any other startups. And secondly, uh, uh, as a part of the big data platform center construction project, a wide range of government department agencies together with the municipal, gov municipal government continue to disclose public data for the public use. And then secondly, uh, so Open Data Plaza and countless public data centers after data anonymization process is also uh, one of the steps we made. We may. Today, uh, therefore, massive amount of data set is in law for patent, finance, medical, weather, and that all together provided to, for the public use. Uh, but on, uh, on the same time, government tr tried to draft legislation amendment of the data privacy law, which uh, we tried to achieve the adequate decision of GDPR from European countries. This is very important. For the this is a really important standard to protect uh, personal data in terms of AI development. While AI-driven innovation ecosystem depends heavily on valuable data, Strict personal privacy regulation are also very important. And then South Korea seeks to strike a reasonable balance between data privacy and sharing valued data. In this slide, the South Korean government provides a standard on de identification personal data. This is technology standard, this is law. Every, uh, every data processor should satisfy this standard. This, this is uh, asked from the South Korea civil society uh, voices. This is, uh, we, this, is, this is the way we just take balance, we reflect the uh, voices from the multi-stakeholders. And uh, uh, on the flip side, emerging technology are pose an enormous security risk. Government agencies and businesses currently face an unprecedented volume of the cyber attack. In order to other, address growing threat of the sophisticated cyber attack, South Korean President's Office has drawn up national cyber security strategy in this year the end of last year. This strategic prime of focus on providing allows a safe and more secure online environment. The government has continued to blast their cyber defense capability by building a system to detect response to cyber attack in real time. This is the approach you actually need private, private, private public partnership, essentially. To, to this, this end, Korea has invested a substantial budget of developing state-of-art AI-based technology to the big data analysis. And then, the very interesting part of the South Korea is that South Korea's Internet Security Agency only developed AI-powered system to detect malicious attack online on real-time basis. This is a very useful, and we disseminate this tool to the all, all, all uh, university level and college level and run this open academy to share its best practice. This is one of the very representative examples that we already uh, make most of AI technology to detect cybersecurity attack. And in the same vein, uh, South Korean KLIGF already uh, focused on this uh, issue uh, sustainably. Uh, uh, this, uh, today's, uh, this year's uh, the theme of the KLIGF was sustainable internet governing together. And then to address a lot of uh, issues emerging from, uh, emerging from emerging technologies, we, our official address, uh, like uh, malicious use of AI, artificial intelligence on cybersecurity and responses, and cybersecurity and democratic governance, and labor platform and economy, and import industrial revolution. And tutorial session also included AI up application and ethics and government of AI, which I uh, deliberate in front of people. And then this is our uh, uh, approach of South Korea. And then we, South Korea government, do many things to cover the issues of emerging technology. Also, in the same time, KLIG focus have covered the very precise op optimality issue about the, from the uh, emerging technology. This is uh, how, we, how we are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Young Chang, for bringing also these important questions. I think it can relate also to the Macedonian IGF input 
focused on cybersecurity and safety for the country. And the open data, for sure, will stay for us uh, for a long time to be addressed um, by, by the multi-stakeholder commun communities. Uh, this segment uh, will be concluded by the very last, but of course not the least, input coming from the Latin American region, from the Colombian IGF. Carolina is with us. I know that you've invested efforts in increasing the internet penetration through legally reforming the ICT sector in the country. And uh, we would like to see what role the emerging technologies played in that action. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation. I am very glad to be here on behalf of the IGF uh, community in Colombia. Um, that we did our fora last October, and to report back, we would like to we choose the, the issues of uh, connectivity, inclusion, specifically on the topics of community networks. Um, all the actors in Colombia, from a multi-stakeholder perspective, agree that inclusion is a, is a key topic, and because of the penetration of internet has reached over 50% of the population in Colombia, uh, the digital divide is concentrated mostly now in rurality and affects mostly or more uh, women and ethnic minorities. Therefore, it's an important uh, social problem to address. Because of this, last year, the Ministry of ICT presented a legal reform on ICT that has as a key uh, address issue to, to deal with the digital divide with a model of facilitating commercial connectivity. This uh, was very well received by ISPs and private sector. Still, those uh, community networks that were working in the region trying to address from the last mile uh, in a bottom-up approach uh, connectivity issues were worried that this legal frame was not facilitating the the access, direct access of these communities to the spectrum. Therefore, community networks gathered together and started a campaign, an advocate campaign, to be included in the law. And needless to say, in this fora, that network communities are key actors from a bottom-up uh, perspective, and the connectivity they can provide is facilitated by emerging technologies that are now accessible to anybody. However, um, the, there is a point where they need access to the spectrum, and this can only be facilitated by law. Um, I'm not going to go in deep on, on the model that it facilitates through, through network communities, but I would just highlight that Latin America has had a very successful history of uh, bridging the digital divide through these kinds of models. Uh, the advocate campaign was not successful completely because uh, we did not manage to make the way into the into the law to, for us or for an express mention of the network communities. Nor we have uh, currently uh, direct access to the autonomous and direct access to the to the spectrum. Still, the campaign was able to visibilize the problem, the legal uh, aspect, and uh, both government, the Congress, and even uh, private sector acknowledged the need for uh, this direct access for the, for the community networks and opened a small window in the law that had facilitated um, finally a pilot that is being deployed by uh, civil society and government for a mobile community network in a very far away rural Colombia. Apart from this, and because we were, um, we are worried that this acknowledge should, should be broader, uh, we started um, a judicial a demand to ask the court for this recognition through, an inconstitu through addressing um, an inconstitutionality of the scope of the law. I believe, or we in Colombia believe, that uh, if, the, if the court decides on this, we will have an important and broader recognition of communities as important actors, bottom-up, in connectivity. And this case can be uh, a way of, of seeing this problem from a multi-stakeholder perspective that allows several and different uh, approaches to the inclusion problem. Thank you very much. 
Carolina, thank you very much. Um, and we are looking forward to actually see the final outcomes in terms of connected people in Colombia at the end of the timeline of this uh, interesting project. Thank you very much. With this, we are concluding this first section of the session. As, uh, as said at the beginning, the purpose of this section uh, in agreement with all the NRIs was to actually showcase to all of you how emerging technologies are serving people in various countries and regions and how priorities are completely different. So you've seen, while in some parts of the world we are using emerging technologies to bring clean water or to make food affordable for everyone, in other parts of the world, completely on another side of the planet, we are using it to combat earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, and other natural disasters. While in other parts, we're using the AI to increase, first of all, the, mob, uh, the, the internet penetration, connect people, especially focusing on vulnerable groups and people living in rural areas where the infrastructure is still very expensive to bring in. But those are still very expensive. Those are still very encouraging examples, because this means that the multi-stakeholder communities in more than 90 countries, 17 regions organizing the national and regional IGFs, have not just the awareness about the importance of the emerging technologies to transform our societies in a positive way, but also that they're taking concrete actions to do that in a multi-stakeholder uh, manner. And I think that's, that's excellent. And, uh, the progress is quite promising for uh, the application of emerging technologies to grow across countries and regions. Joshua and Tracy, I hope you're catching up with the notes. This has been quite a complex discussion, and we are going to make it even more complex in the second section of this session, because we are opening now the floor. All of you coming from certain parts of the world are most welcome to tell us how the emerging technologies are being used in the companies, organizations where you work, in your cities, in your countries, in your regions. I would, I'm just going to say that I will prioritize the inputs that are coming from the NRIs that have submitted written case studies that will be subject for a unique publication to be uh, developed and finalized shortly after this session concludes at the IGF. There are three standing microphones in the room for those that don't have these microphones, uh, mobile microphones or the desk microphones. While you're preparing and thinking that you would like to take the floor, I'm going to kindly ask our colleagues from the Belarus IGF to briefly address the emerging technology topic discussed at just recently held uh, National Belarus IGF and to tell us in general what is the situation in the country and whether there are any concerns and threats present there for people. Thank you very much, Anya, for letting Belarus IGF be a part of this discussion. Um, as you said rightly, the Belarus IGF was just 10 days prior to the global IGF, uh, and we focused not only on the emerging technologies, uh, but generally how technologies influence the inclusion and accessibility of data and information in our country. Belarus is only starting the discussion of this topic, how inclusion is perceived and uh, what types of it exist. Um, generally, we talked about technological inclusion and language inclusion. And here are the main conclusions that we have after the Belarus IGF. Uh, one of the first of them, and I think the main important part, is that despite the rapid development of technologies in Belarus and Belarus IT sector, there is a noticeable gap between the technological development of the country uh, and the level of inclusion of not only the internet itself, but also those technologies that provide the technological leap in the country. Uh, despite the existing state standard for the governmental websites that include the compulsory version for visually impaired people, business does not consider it necessary to create versions not only for the visually impaired people, but also for elder people, which is making up to 30% of the Belarusian population. Focusing on the positive impact of the new technologies on the digital inclusion and accessibility was uh, one of the most important innovations of this year was the electronic population census, which became available due to the applying of the interbank system of identification. 
millions of people had an opportunity to log into the electronic census with their passport data, which were confirmed by the ISI during the login in two complete census without leaving home. And the last but not the least, the first step of the language inclusion, which is also was discussed during the Belarus IGF, was made in 2015, uh, when the national Cyrillic domain .bel was introduced in Belarus. Uh, this Cyrillic domain makes Belarusian internet segment more accessible environment for those who have difficulties with Latin symbols. More and more significant projects choose .bel domain, and the case of Belarusian census that I have just talked about, that also use the IDN domain for their site, was one of the brightest examples of the advantage of the domain of the national language after four years of the introducing the Bell domain. Thank you very much. Helen, thank you very much also for bringing the inclusiveness as a very important concept of the IGF, uh, and in that sense, uh, the importance of local content for the people in certain countries. The US is, of course, a very important, geographically speaking, but also politically speaking, technologically speaking, important part of the world. And I would like to ask uh, Melinda, the co-chair of the IGF USA, to tell us more about what are the, currently the discussion priorities for the community of the US in terms of the emerging technologies. Thank you, Anya. At IGF USA, we talk about emerging technologies pretty much uh, every year. Uh, we've had a strong focus in the last few years uh, discussing the Internet of Things from the specific applications, the ethics, and the security. Uh, the emerging technology that's getting most of the attention right now uh, throughout the United States is artificial intelligence. We have uh, Today, the applications are seen in the financial sector, the IT community, education, and throughout uh, specific government uh, technologies. The federal government has issued a, a call to provide more insight and research into defining artificial intelligence. Uh, that includes uh, the core of, you know, what is it? What does it actually do? Uh, where can it be most efficient? And how you can apply it throughout uh, the federal government. Uh, the White House is also, as a part of a, a broader technology initiative, is encouraging the private sector uh, to focus on things like ethics and uh, safe deployment and security. Today, the technology and uh, academic stakeholders uh, play the largest role, but it's very important that both civil society um, and government all work collaboratively. Uh, particularly in the area of ethics. We think that a couple of the areas that we need to have more stakeholder inclusion is uh, representing all types of users, uh, particularly the applications that affect both uh, older populations as well as uh, our youth. So in our session, there was an acknowledgement for uh, a need for more definition, uh, more standards, uh, but the conclusion was that this should be happening um, much like everything else does in the technology development in a multi-stakeholder process rather than through additional legislation or any regulation. Um, and so that we have uh, the public, private, and civil society groups coming together to collaborate, uh, define standards, usage, and ethics. Linda, thank you very much, and especially for bringing the concept of ethics in the application of the emerging technologies. I would like to ask Lucien to maybe follow up on this. The French IGF especially centralized the ethics uh, in uh, their discussions in the recently held, well, recently a few months ago held the French IGF. And especially I'm referring to the important announcement of the President Macron during the 13th IGF in Paris last year, also 
relates to the uh, application of new digital technologies. So, Lucien, can you just bring us a bit that concept here and especially refer to the standards in France just to be able to compare it with the standards coming from the US? Hi, uh, everyone. Thank you, uh, Anya, for bringing that up. Well, indeed, the French IGF was held 4th uh, of July. Uh, so this year, we had a number of workshops, actually 12 uh, workshops and a, a number of plenaries. And, well, we decided to have four main tracks to allow and enable decision. The first one was on the responsible digitalization, following up, obviously, as you said, uh, President Macron announcements at the last global IGF in Paris at UNESCO. Um, the second tract was focusing on digital inclusion. The third one was on data governance, uh, mirroring, obviously, uh, the one at the global IGF. And the last one was between governance and regulation. So basically, um, the idea um, is to follow up on international and French initiatives at the global and local levels. Um, we announced the Paris call for security in cyberspace uh, last year at the Global IGF, and there is a number of new initiatives going on, including the Christchurch call, uh, of which France uh, is a part on uh, terrorism. Uh, we also had uh, initiatives in France at the local level, including a law on um, disinformation, fake news, uh, during elections, and we had the law also uh, being discussed actually uh, at this time on aid speech. So there is a number, um, well, of key concerns being discussed. I'll focus on, well, two of them. The first one, very quickly, obviously, is content regulation, uh, as uh, you may have guessed. Um, and reflecting on that, the second one is artificial intelligence as it is used for content regulation and broadly um, in, a, in, a, in the economy. So on, on age speech and, and other content regulation, well, there is uh, quite uh, a debate in France to bring all, stakeholder, all stakeholders to the table to be able to really discuss these issues as it is um, most likely problematic with human rights. Uh, there have been a number of discussions at French level with the French Digital Council, with, for example, the French Human Rights Commission. And uh, this mainly focus on the use of artificial intelligence and automated algorithm to spot uh, content and to obviously infringe free speech. So this kind of debate is still ongoing in France and is echoing a number of global debates also. And that was one of the main takeovers of the French uh, IGF. Thank you. Lucien, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, bringing the inputs. I encourage everyone to actually read the re final report of the French IGF, which is very interesting, brings some um, even innovative concepts, but also questions for all of us that I think can just um, uh, kind of add to our concerns that we already have in terms of the human rights standards applied uh, when, when speaking about the application of emerging technologies. We already heard from the southeastern part of Europe, uh, thanks to the North Macedonian um, IGF and uh, Predrag's excellent input. But then the issue with these emerging technologies that's uh, actually a challenge for all of us is that even in local communities, as I said, there is a digital divide present. It's always difficult to address everyone, to make a forum, let's say, or a process that's going to address concerns of everyone, those living in rural, in rural parts of the country, in urban parts of the country, those maybe that don't traditionally see themselves in a the role of a discussion on uh, internet policy. So we also need to raise awareness there. Those maybe that don't know how to use the emerging technologies, despite the fact that they have access to it, bringing the digital literacy there. So with that, because the, that part of the Europe is also very interesting and diversified, we heard perspective from the Balkan region, but I would like to move maybe outside of the Balkan region and to ask for help from my colleagues from the South, Southeastern European IGF, CEDIG, um, Serena or Liana, just to give us a few inputs. 
What is happening in that region? I remember when we talked, I know that the CEDIC will be hold, uh, held in um, Moldova next year. I know Moldova is an interesting country with a great startup community, which is not that much common for other parts of the, of the region. So maybe you could just briefly uh, reflect on that. <coughs> Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Anya. Um, indeed, we have just announced that our next annual meeting is going to be in Moldova, and we're um, well, we are actually broadly a developing region. It's not like we score very high in um, rankings of developed countries around the world. But um, yes, we're making a step to supporting more capacity development activities around the region, and the choice for Moldova is part of um, those efforts. Now, going back to the topic of today's discussion, emerging digital technologies, there was um, a question, there is a question that we're also supposed to address today on how emerging technologies could support the engagement of vulnerable groups at the national and regional level. Um, at CDIC this year, we had a discussion on accessibility, on accessible, available, and affordable digital technologies for all. And I will just give you a few examples of um, specific cases that were presented and discussed at um, this session of how technologies have been used to support the inclusion of vulnerable groups. Um, and I'll try to be as fast as possible. So um, there was a, a quite um, nice quote from someone at the session, and I will just read it. If for most people, technology makes things easier, for people with disabilities, technology makes things possible. Mm. We think that was a very good reflection of what digital technologies can actually do for um, vulnerable groups. And on this note, there was an example given of an assistive technology that can improve accessibility. Uh, Motivation Romania Foundation and Vodafone uh, Foundation managed to promote and introduce an app called Eva Facial Mouse. Once installed on a mobile device, the app uses the device incorporated camera to track the movements of a user's face and basically use it like a mouse. So being able to use electronic communication devices independently, allowing um, users with disabilities to be empowered and better exercise their rights to information, education, privacy um, online. Um, sticking to Romania, there was an option a few years ago introduced by the national broadcasters um, allowing users to enable the captioning for news and other content being presented on the screens of their TVs. And that was specifically beneficial for people with hearing impairments. Um, and then, of course, we're all aware of um, YouTube, Netflix, and other similar services captioning options um, as examples of good practices when it comes to providing accessibility for people with hearing impairments. Um, a few other examples were brought to light during our discussions of cases in which persons with disabilities managed to successfully advocate for their rights to access digital technologies or products. For example, um, in Georgia, and I'm, we have our colleagues here, um, a local NGO representing persons with visual impairments has sued the Ministry of Health for not making their website accessible. Not asking for financial retribution, but rather trying to make sure that the government is paying attention to ensuring that digital products that it procures are accessible for persons with disabilities. Um, maybe Ucha can follow up on that if um, something happened and there is more accessibility now. Um, likewise, in Turkey, a student's NGO advocated for the Ministry of Education to enable students with visual impairments to take university exams in alternative ways. Because initially such tests were standardized in written form and you know that's not really accessible for everyone. Now, um, thanks to this campaign, students with visual impairments are able to take the exams assisted by audio technology or through the use of the Braille alphabet. And that's another um, achievement of you know, grassroots initiatives and advocating for the rights of people. Um, and on that note, um, the message from our community and from our discussion was that sometimes, we, or most of the times, we tend to, to ignore these kind of issues because we don't think beyond our um, own perspectives. But for people with disabilities, um, it is really important for all of us to look a bit more into uh, what can be done to empower them and encourage them to use digital technologies, because at the end of the day, they do benefit everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Serena, also for bringing perspectives from um, yes, other countries that we didn't hear from, that you can see they're very 
different. And I, I also encourage to all of you to read the messages from CEDIC, which are very kind of concise, very interesting. And um, following those messages, I also participated online, listening to very vibrant discussions. I know that the 5G was also one of the hot topics. Um, and uh, not all countries, unfortunately, have the same approach to it. Neither they have the national digital strategies that could help for that to implement. So um, I think probably when you meet in Moldova, that's going to be pro again on the agenda. So I'm very much looking forward to those interesting inputs. So with, with this, I think we've uh, heard from the, a, lot, a lot of inputs from the Eastern European parts of the world. I think there is one uh, online participant, is it, Liana? I would like to intervene. Not for now, okay. And then I'm going to turn to Liana later for our online participants to give them the floor. But um, I would like us now from Europe to move again to Latin America. It's a very and Caribbean, very interesting part of the world, especially the Caribbean region, because of its geographic position. Uh, a lot of uh, small island countries, which just are very challenging uh, by their nature regarding the infrastructure. And that's very important for all of us. And maybe uh, I would ask the Guatemala IGF, I don't know if Leah is here or somebody else, just to tell us, in, you can use that standing microphone, or oh, yes, you can sit there. Just to tell us, Leah, what are the priorities in Guatemala? And how do you see the emerging technologies? How are they helping people there? Remember that I'm from Panama, not from Guatemala. <laughs> okay, let's then move to Panama. And then I'm going to ask for Guatemala later. <laughs> okay, I'm going to talk, I'm going to speak in Spanish because it's my mother tongue. Okay. Uh, In 2019, we had the second edition of the Panama IGF. This is an initiative that um, was founded in 2017. After we had hosted the IGF for Latin America and the Caribbean. The main issues on our agenda, which issues that are very important for the people in Panama and in Central America throughout the region are as fault. Privacy, data protection, because we are located in the proximity of two large countries, Mexico and Colombia, but we do not have any legislation that would be tailored to our current needs. And we have a lot of security issues in our region. Our government wants to resolve this by surveying people, so by deploying um, uh, surveying technology in a, on a massive scale in all our countries. And this is something that we find to be much too invasive and intrusive for our citizens' privacy. Very often, there's also a lack of knowledge on the part of citizens who are not aware of their rights. And the government thinks that this could resolve all our problems. And this is why our IGF has focused on these issues. So data privacy, um, biometrics, and uh, f uh, also on raising awareness amongst the population so that people should know that these are technologies and technological applications that should serve the people, not the other way around. The same as, uh, uh, this is exactly what uh, Federal Chancellor Merkel said in her opening speech of this IGF. So these are our priorities, our main priorities. The, um, this is, um, what we're thinking about. So what do we want to do in order to make our cities, cities like Panama City, uh, to a to smart cities, into smart cities without attacking our citizens' privacy? So Panama is in a strategic location between the two Americas, between North and South America. And this government and also the previous governments have wanted to make us a technology hub for the Americas. But in order for this to actually happen, and in order to attract tech companies to Panama, we will have to meet certain requirements, not only fiscal requirements, that's already in place, but also at the level of public policies. 
This is necessary in order to actually attract investment and also raise the attractiveness of Panama. And so far, this has not been the case, which is why we are having a session which will be dedicated to exploring um, how these technologies can open up these opportunities whilst also protecting human rights so that the Internet can be more open and more secure. In Panama, we still have seven indigenous tribes. We don't have that many indigenous people as Guatemala, for instance. But um, we want to make sure that these groups, too, have access to the Internet. And we are exploring measures that could be taken. So um, Internet Society is actually uh, exploring this so that we can take the Internet to these tribes so that the Internet can be open, free and universal for all, including these groups. This is how we want to give these people access to work and to a better quality of life. So this would be my summary of the issues that we uh, have that we have been debating in the Panama IGF. Thank you very much, Anya, for your work that you've been doing all over this year. Thank you very much. For just to underline once again, I don't know if we have anyone from Guatemala IGF here. It would be good to hear also, since we are in that part of the world, maybe to conclude on that. But it seems it seems not. Then, um, then I'm thanking, uh, thanking Leah a lot. Maybe just to stay in the region while, before we go back to, um, to Europe and conclude this section and then allow all of you to uh, ask either questions to our colleagues or just share the inputs from your side. Maybe Roberto from Bolivia IGF, you also hosted the Latin American IGF. And maybe you could tell us in the country, because it's also geographically quite interesting, an interesting part of the world, to tell us more about the presence of emerging technologies and maybe reflect a bit on the Latin American region in, uh, because you hosted the regional IGF uh, very recently. I was very, and I know that the topic was discussed widely uh, with, uh, with several countries being represented there in a multi-stakeholder nature. So it would be interesting to hear from, from you on that as well. Thank you very much, Anja. Um, well, actually, uh, as, you, as you well said before, there are a lot of differences between one region to another and one country to another. It, that's true. And uh, in our cases, I will say, in, in Bolivia, we're in the middle. Um, I will say that they are, there are isolated efforts about um, facing the the um, IoT advances, uh, artificial intelligence too, mostly um, based in the universities. They are working a lot with uh, different uh, uh, research, research, research um, projects. And uh, one of the things we wanted to do last year was to, I mean last year and, 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 and this year too, was to uh, get together to all the different uh, multi-stakeholders. We arrange um, about four, four workshops. I am talking about of the work that we made as a Bolivian chapter. And uh, we work it with the regulator, the Bolivian regulator, the telecommunications vice, vice ministry, and uh, a couple of universities. So what, what we aimed to do by that time was to um, provide um, a draft in order to um, uh, perform tests to IoT devices, to um, provide a draft to give some sort of uh, regulation that all of the sellers of these devices should comply. That was the idea. So I think that was a really good experience, and that is going to allow us to work uh, with the subject in the future. The other thing that I think wasn't covered and I, I think that's another important thing in terms of inclusion, is as an emerging technology, the, the, this new 5G um, mobile technology. Again, we are really far to, to, to get 5G implemented in our country, but we, we tried again to, to gather all the different sectors in Bolivia. We had um, a couple of... Uh, of meetings, we invited to have their their different points of view, and of course we 
we found out that we still have a lot of work to do regarding particularly uh, spectrum liberation in order to provide the, the bandwidth that this technology is going to need. But again, it was another place to remember as community that we still have uh, another technologies like the recent 4G that we're not taking advantage yet as we should, we should do as, as country. Perhaps because of the pricing model that we still have and the, that we need to change for the future. Because that's going to support a lot the inclusion for the people that, that still not, is not connected in, in Bolivia. And I think the, the same happens in, in other regions and, and countries. And about, the, about our, our regional IGF, I think we also we didn't have several several uh, panels regarding to emerging technologies. Most of them were related to private issues, as Leah said before. Um, there were indeed um, a panel talking about all, in general terms, all the innovations actions that we are providing in the region. And um, I think this, this subject is not uh, being faced in general because, as, as we said before, we have different situations in our different countries about how we are dealing and how we are taking advantage of our emerging technologies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roberto, for also bringing the overall perspective from the Latin America. I think that it's important also for us to address the diversity in the market in terms of um, introducing the emerging technology, especially the 5G and the mobile access in that regard. So maybe later we can also hear from other perspectives. Um, thank you so much for queuing there. I would like to, if you agree, maybe to just uh, stand there and uh, wait a few minutes. Just to conclude with uh, two, three very important inputs coming from uh, mostly Eastern Europe and with youth perspectives, and then we are opening the floor for everyone. Uh, we are still very good with timing. We have around 40 minutes. So I think we'll have plenty of time to hear for, from, uh, from all of you. So if you would then allow me, I would just quickly like to ask, um, actually, before I move to Armenia, youth Ukrainian IGF and Russian IGF, just to kindly ask if anyone from Ecuador IGF is here. Ah, oh, that's you, okay, perfect. Then uh, maybe you could follow up on what Roberto said, because you're close also uh, physically as countries, just to see whether there are similarities or maybe you have completely different priorities. Thank you, Ajan. I will talk about Ecuador in Spanish, my mother language. Yes, some of the questions that have been asked were also raised in our uh, country and there are also questions relating to vulnerable groups. In Ecuador, we have some groups that are simply not connected. 60% of uh, people in Ecuador are connected to the internet, but the rest isn't. So what about these people? Well, the public authorities in Ecuador sometimes provide information about the family structures of peoples and these information were wrong. So they were simply taken over from fathers to sons uh, to grandsons um, and we have so many people in Ecuador. Not everybody is connected to the internet and in Ecuador information about people who pass away still uh, remain on the internet and this is a massive problem for us. On the other hand, uh, we also debated new technologies, emerging technologies and how they can pose a threat. As you know, and we heard it in uh, a different panel or someone else said about uh, the problems that exist for people with disabilities. There was even a hype with regard to biometric capturing of personal data. And now we're talking about access to public services, in particular access to biometric data of people with disabilities. So these 
people use their biometrics to navigate the internet and their data is sometimes available on the internet without these people having consented to their biometric details being used in this way. So this means that the public sector could have access to this data and there's absolutely no safeguard in place. So what can we do to curtail this? The multi-stakeholders and the IG IGF Ecuador dedicated its fifth session to this issue and we concluded the following. First of all, we need to put better protection in place for private data of people in Ecuador. And it's extremely important to include uh, biometric data in this uh, protection, particularly biometric data of people, of minors and of people with disabilities, so of people who cannot give their content. I think often forgetting that all those that are not connected to the internet doesn't mean that they are not there, present online. Their data are being used, sometimes even in commercial purposes. And it's very important, as, a, as under the social contract of every country and globally, that we made those people aware, first of all, and then to work on digital literacy to connect them and to um, secure that they're educated how to use the technologies safely. Thank you very much. We can, uh, hopefully, we will back to that very interesting concept and important. With this, I think I would uh, conclude this section with covering the Eastern European region, the parts of, the, of that region that we didn't hear from. So with that, I would like to uh, hear very briefly for, well, uh, so Liana is actually multitasking here. So she is our remote moderator and we're very thankful for that help. She's also running a very successful national IGF with other stakeholders in the country. It is the Armenian IGF. It's a country that's uh, developing in terms of the application of uh, emerging technologies. And I would like to give floor to Liana to tell us more about the priorities in the country. Hi. Thank you, Anya, very much. Um, and I will speak uh, here on behalf of the Armenian IGF and my capacity as a coordinator. Um, so. Emerging technologies have multiple implications for the uh, economy and society, and uh, they open up opportunities for new business models. They enable sociocultural development and have immense potential in the educational sector. During the fifth Armenian IGF that we had this year in October, we discussed about augmented reality, AR, as an emerging technology and its impact on digital economy and education. AR has seen significant progress over the past decade and is now increasingly used in areas such as business, logistics, gaming, manufacturing, retail industry, etc. More and more technology experts and companies are becoming aware of the potential of AR and they are looking into developing new AR applications or using existing ones to enhance their businesses. Armenia is known as a country with a very rich cultural heritage and history. Recently, an Armenian-based AR company and the Ministry of Culture have started working on a project dedicated to creating an AR depicting famous national artists and their masterpieces. Many museums, galleries, and historical monuments in the country need to be more attractive to locals and uh, foreigners, and of course, the young generation, to be able to better promote Armenians' cultural heritage or of around 3,000 years. Integrating innovative technologies such as AR brings depth to the artworks present in the cultural institutions around the country and make them more attractive and fascinating for both locals and people who visit the country. Another project planned in cooperation with the Ministry of Education aims to make textbooks and the overall learning experience in schools more uh, attractive. By using AR technology, any information or data can be passed on the learners in real time through the use of multidimensional visualizations that allow them to get a better understanding of the studied objects or phenomena. The pilot project covers physics at this moment, 
and it is meant to provide students with an opportunity to learn the phenomena and principles of physics uh, with the use of AR technology. Depending on the success of this pilot, other subjects in the school curricula will be enhanced by the application of AR, thus making the process of teaching and learning easier, more engaging, and unforgettable. So these were the discussions we had this year. Thank you very much, Liana. I think you also um, mentioned the importance of youth and young people, having them educated and equipped for discussions like this, but also for the utilization of emerging technologies. The NRIs globally as a network are also very important that the sustainability of these processes relies on having the young people involved from early stages in these processes so that later somebody can successfully inherit what you made and continue to build on it and um, hopefully made, uh, make a safer environment for all of us. So with that, I think it's important that we hear also from youth perspectives in this session. How is youth perceiving the emerging technologies uh, in Ukraine? There's a youth IGF uh, in Ukraine that are doing an excellent job. And I would like to give floor to, um, yes, I think it's about, you are going to speak. Hi. The youth oh. Ukrainian IGF uh, to tell yes. us. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Valerie. I'm from Ukraine, and I'm uh, the moderator of uh, youth uh, IGF UA. And uh, uh, here I am as a um, uh, participant of youth summit, uh, uh, youth IGF summit. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Anya, for mentioning uh, youth participation because, uh, you know, uh, this morning we had. Uh, some uh, meeting with Vint, uh, and uh, you know it is really important for us as uh, for the youth to be uh, able to speak and to be able to be heard because um, you know it, it is really important. Uh, and um, just briefly about our um, uh, our achievements uh, this year, uh, we uh, discussed a lot about uh, inclusiveness during the youth IGF UA and um uh, you know, uh, uh, we had a group of pupils from uh, Bila Tserkva city, and uh, they uh, um, had an investigation of governmental uh, websites, how they are um, designed for visually impaired uh, users. And you know, uh, not all of them are uh, on the high level, but uh, you know, um, I'm really happy and I'm really proud that we have uh, taken this first step in the long way of our um, process to be, uh, to, uh, to put this uh, issue of inclusiveness on the um, high level. And um, my message will be uh, the next one. I, um, I want everyone, every stakeholder to be uh, together to, uh, in order to um, reach this aim because, you know, only when you are together, we can, um, we can do everything. So, yes, thank you. That's a wonderful message and it will definitely be useful for Joshua and Tracy to put it in the, in the report something that's um, extremely important for not just youth, but also for this kind of more senior uh, community gathered around the IGF and of course broadly. Uh, with that, let's just uh, conclude on that region. The Russian IGF this year marked its 10th anniversary. Uh, the agenda was quite rich. International community was also in Moscow this year discussing among other hot topics, the emerging technologies. Mr. Laonit is with us and he will tell us more about the importance of digital technologies for a Russian community and concerns that you have in that regard. Добрый день, Анна. Большое спасибо за предоставленную возможность выступить от Please allow me to speak in Russian, which is my native language. I would like to tell you a few things about the Russian IGF and the Russian Internet. We are not only celebrating 50 years of the Internet this year, 
but more than 20 years ago the um, first RU domain was given out in the Russian Federation. It was first only used by research organizations and now for 25 years this Russian internet has been a unique ecosystem with a huge diversity of services, social networks, networks, mail servers, online and trade platforms and many, many more. It is important to underline that the Russian Internet, as we see it, has been and remains a part of the global digital space. We are open to startups and investment, and this openness is a priority for our policymakers. One of our um, top politicians recently supported that and uh, stated it at the Russian Internet Governance Forums. The organizer of this forum is the Coordination Center for Dem Domains in the Russian Federation, which is, amongst other, a com commercial task which um, has the responsibility to develop the Internet and the global Internet community and as well. It is important to understand that if you want to secure functioning of the n Internet, you need to embrace promising technologies such as AI. It is important to underline that one that we've discussed this in the context of the Russian forum, the IGF, and we took these results into account, for example, in um, developing the new Russian strategy on AI. The next important issue that needs debating is data protection and the fight against cybercrime. We believe that a good solution can only be found in the context of international cooperation. And this is why it makes sense to have permanent working groups with international organizations, groups that represent national governments, in order to develop balanced and nuanced solutions that serve the best interests of all stakeholders. We believe that the multi-stakeholder approach has been successful in solving Internet issues where states are considered of guarantors of legal protections. On the one hand, any regulation has to ensure secure and sustainable development of the internet and the protection of uh, citizens and businesses. But you also need to look at the other side of the coin, which is to provide incentives for further development and technological uh, uh, progress in a competitive environment. Thank you very much for bringing the inputs from Russia to our session. I think uh, it seems that data are across the countries and regions very important. The Russian IGF is also a good um, example of the involvement of all stakeholders that work together. The technical community is critical in terms of organizing and running the process. The government is very supportive and uh, represented, has a high level representation actually at the meeting which is very, very good for the recognition of the importance of the national IGF process. Uh, with that, I believe I've exhausted my list of um, those that submitted the very uh, good case study inputs, but there are a number of those that would like to take the floor coming directly from the NRIs. So I see colleagues are also queuing up. I will uh, give a floor now to Shabana from the Afghanistan IGF, and then I would go to Roman, then to Mary. Hello everyone, um, thank you Anya, and please accept our apologies for not being there uh, due to arriving late to 
here. But I would like to do, talk about the history of IGF in Afghanistan. Um, IGF, Afghanistan IGF is the national IGF of Afghanistan. This provides a platform for multi-stakeholder dialogue on public policy issues related to development and use of internet in Afghanistan. Um, IGF is uh, launched in Afghanistan in 2017, and it has been recognized by the United Nations IGF Secretariat, and the mission of IGF Afghanistan is to create a society that is aware of internet governance issues and actively engage multi stakeholders in Afghanistan. Um, the first IGF uh, took place in 2017, where more than 350 participants came together and discussed the key issues related to IG in Afghanistan. Going on, the second IGF uh, was organized in 2018 in the um, month of uh, May, and the third uh, IGF, national IGF, which we had, was in uh, July 2019. We are 500 participants representing uh, various stakeholder groups, such as government, private sector, civil society, and technical community, joined the debate on key elements of IG in Afghanistan. Um, well, uh, the recent IGF or IGF uh, 2019 in Afghanistan illustrated a broad scope of discussions on how best ensure good uh, internet governance practices, considering aspects such as accessibility and affordability, technical and regulatory matters, consumer protection, equitable development for all, and a range of other challenges requiring multi stakeholder cooperation. It's worth mentioning that IGF Afghanistan is the only national IGF initiative which has Kids Academy, which is a unique characteristic of the IGF. The other sessions which were held during uh, third IGF in 2019 were Cybersecurity Trust and Privacy Dim. We had a total of five sessions we had. Then going on human rights, gender, and youth, Evolution of IG, digital government, development, innovation, and economic issues, media and content, digital inclusion, accessibility, and emerging technologies. The Savannah? IG Fate 2019. Can I jump in here? Because I've streamed the Afghanistan IGF. And it was uh, such, such a vibrant set of discussions for a country that has, I think, less than 10% of internet penetration in terms of meaningful access. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Can you just turn to what exactly was discussed in the context of emerging technologies in Afghanistan? I know that AI mm -hmm. was, was on the agenda and broadly discussed. Uh, yes, as emerging uh, technologies, AI and also IoT was discussed, and also, um, as mentioned, uh, it was discussed through uh, different representatives from government and also uh, from private sector, and also on the um, creation of uh, the um, infrastructure, and also, uh, most importantly, on the accessibility and affordability of internet was discussed in order to um, use and have these technologies in the country. Thank, thank you very much. The Afghanistan IGF report will be online uh, soon on your website, on the IGF website. I'll encourage everyone to look, but mostly maybe to stream your meeting, because it was very fascinating in terms of also the gender balance in Afghanistan and the discussions discussed. Thank you very much, Shabana, for, for your inputs. Roman is also with us, our MAG member coming from Russia, uh, representing government. Can I ask you, yes, please, to take the floor? Thank you so much, Anya. Dear colleagues, it was really interesting to listen to how you develop uh, your IGFs in your countries and your communities. And uh, a lot of efforts I see and a lot of experience and best practices, which I'm sure uh, Russia can also take into consideration for our future fora. And looking to the map, um, I would like to add that Asia-Pacific uh, regional IGF also took part in Vladivostok. So this part of the world was also covered this year. And uh, we have our booth 
here um, uh, from the Russian Center for Promotion of International Initiatives where we have uh, all outcome documents of the events uh, which were uh, uh, made up together by the efforts of uh, multi-stakeholder communities so you can have a look and um, many ideas which were uh, announced during the previous presidency in France, during the Paris call, during this new compact for the web and uh, other initiatives uh, outlined by Mr. Altmaier and uh, Joe Keza, uh, actually very um, much of things are similar and interconnecting and so I really recommend you have a look. Uh, but I would like to also support uh, my friends from uh, Armenia uh, honorable speakers from Belarus, from Ukraine, from Moldova, and uh, I really like your parts about uh, cultural heritage and how young people can stay involved through the internet. And I would love to really join our efforts uh, to promote uh, saving of our cultural heritage, of languages, uh, using the modern technologies, and uh, also calling to you, calling to Russian National Coordination Center of .RU. I would like to propose to um, invite each other throughout our Eurasian space to the fora of each other, because I think it would be really interesting exchange of opinions. And of course, the whole world is also very, very welcome to come to the Russian IJFs and other events we host in Russia. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Roman. That's actually a very good point, practically speaking, for the Secretariat's work. The pins on the map are where the Secretariat for a particular NRI is, but we could actually do that by the location every year, move the pins, which is also important. If you don't mind, I know we have a couple of requests uh, from colleagues that are sitting around this table. I would maybe give floor to colleagues that are waiting in line, standing, and then come back to you. So I would go to Mary now, then I know you were waiting also for a while, and then to Sandra. Yeah. Thank you, Anya. I want to say that I'm so happy about this exchange we're having here. My name is Mary Uduma. I'm from Nigeria, um, Nigeria IGF, um, um, precisely as well as West Africa IGF. In, a, in community and environment, we, we, we are really um, um, particular about what the new technologies can bring to solve our immediate problems. We have some problems. We are agrarian in nature, and uh, we have seen um, uh, communities um, and uh, uh, technology companies coming up with um, drones to, 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 to um, water our farms and um, uh, fertilize our farms and um, disinfect our farms. So that's what one of the things that the new technology is doing for us. Um, but we still need to uh, solve problem of security, um, uh, security in terms of life and properties. And we also need to solve the problem of um, power if new technologies could bring that also, we we'll still see it. And I want to suggest that it would just not just be exchange, exchange, exchange. Maybe the network, the NRI network will look at, is, would this bring about uh, collaboration, networking, and seeing how we could uh, help one another? Uh, I like what Italian IGF is doing, what uh, Chad IGF is doing, what Russia IGF is doing. Is there, can we take up as, um, as uh, intersectional work what, where we could also exchange and see whether uh, um, technology companies working in one part of the world will help the other part of the world. That's my, 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 my intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. This is how it starts. The collaboration starts from a dialogue. I think this session will make us all aware of the excellent work happening on the NRI levels and hopefully prompt some concrete um, maybe projects among the NRIs. I think there's a colleague here waiting and then we'll go to Sandra. Good morning. My name is Lily Edinam Butcher from Ghana and I coordinate the Ghana Youth IGF. Thankfully, we had a meeting edition of the Ghana Youth IGF this year and 
I just came from a very insightful meeting with Vint, like she mentioned, and the youth were fully represented and the discussions were really fruitful. So concerning emerging technologies, this year's IGF was on the team, the future of work, digital jobs, and youth inclusion. So we understand that um, we are playing in the fourth industrial revolution where everything is moving from manual to digital. And in my part of the world, when we are talking about emerging technologies, we look at the very root, even talking about connectivity, inclusion, and more. So the very infrastructure that even holds or makes emerging technologies possible is what we try to explore for first. So in this year's meeting edition of the Ghana Youth IGF, we had people come to share with us how possible it is to work towards harnessing the benefits of emerging technologies and to use it to our benefit, especially because people will think about or would fear um, emerging technologies taking over the jobs, but that's not the case. We want to look at this as an enabler and offering more opportunities for young people. And so that was where the conversation was actually um, geared towards. And afterwards, we actually had the opportunity to convene another meeting at the Africa Geospatial Data and Internet Conference, where we spoke more on harnessing um, emerging technologies also in shaping Africa's digital future. So the conversation has been more of how do we deal with the limitations we have because of our geographic location and still working towards joining the world in meeting or reaping from the benefit that emerging technologies, emerging technologies such as IoT and AI has to offer. Beyond that, we are, looking about, we are looking at sustainability and continuity. The talk has to be implemented, but from which angle? And who sets the pace? Who gives the finance? Who, who, who gives the grants? And how do we continue to actually implement all that I've been spoken about? So we are actually taking everything that we've been discussing from April this year into consideration. And we are looking to meet more um, initiatives here that could, we could partner to do other things. And I think we are going in the right direction. Thank, thank you very much for bringing the, the inputs from Ghana to this session that are, are also very interesting and important for us to hear. Sandra is here for Eurodig from the Euro European IGF, and I would like to give floor now to Sandra. Thank you, Anya. And I hope it's not too late to welcome all of you to my country, because it happens to be that I'm German. And uh, what you just uh, shared with us here is also very enriching for, for us here in Germany to listen to. So, Thank you for sharing your results from your meetings. Um, I will now not speak about what has been discussed last year at Eurodic. Um, you can get our brochure at the booth, but uh, we also promoted it otherwise. I want to use that opportunity to uh, take an outlook at what's coming next. And there are two aspects I would like to raise. First of all, when speaking about emerging technologies and how are we going to implement them in our lives, there is one stakeholder group that plays a particular important role, which are the parliamentarians in your countries. And you might have recognized that we have a significant amount of parliamentarians from across the South, uh, sorry, globe, <laughs> in particular from the global South here at the IGF. And I encourage you to meet them. You will have possibly the best opportunity tomorrow morning in the legislative main session where they will all convene in the summit and basically summarize what kind of conclusion they will take back to their national parliaments. I would encourage you to connect with them in order to involve them in your national and regional IGFs. And secondly, under the light of the discussion and the conclusions on the high-level panel report on digital cooperation, um, I would like to raise um, the opportunity that we have today at lunchtime, besides the global IGF, also Eurodic did the consultation process that we will discuss with the global community today during lunchtime. And in particular, the regional IGFs um, are about to think what this report means for our future work. 
the Latin American IGF has made a, um, a review of their initiative and together with them we decided to hold that very informal gathering but taking into consideration the results of the UN panel report on digital cooperation what does it mean for regional but also for national IGFs and I would like to invite you to these two discussions first of all reviewing the high level report but secondly discussing what is going to be um, the conclusion for our work uh, today, lunchtime, in room one. And um, I hope to see you there. Thank you. We will definitely be there, Sandra. And also thank you for bringing the notion of the legislators. Uh, I've witnessed how difficult it was to engage all legislators, and it resulted in a great success of Sandra and the team in the host country to have them present. And I encourage all NRIs to approach Sandra or well, the best will be Sandra or me, and then I'll connect you to Sandra, because uh, this is a unique opportunity to engage the legislator from your countries into your processes and to have them there as active participants. Uh, with that, I think maybe we can uh, continue with this side, then we'll go here, finish this, also you. We have uh, actually of formal time five more minutes. I think we can go five minutes over time. So there will be in 10 minutes we have to wrap up this session. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Alexander Savnin from Russian Federation, representing civil society. I would like uh, to mention the first uh, thing, that Russia missing the such emerging technology like a real national or regional IGF initiative. We have an event called Russian IGF, but it's completely controlled by Russian CCTLD, which is Gonga and Russian parliament. There is no multi-stakeholder process, no inclusiveness, no possibility for discussion. This year, 10 years, there was no open, uh, even no open, no open mics during this event. It's completely government-controlled event. I would like to ask Secretariat of IJF to control how initiatives called NRIs are really run off. So, also, I would like uh, to thank um, Mr. Levin and Mr. Chukov, representing government, to come here and speak bravely. I would like to mention a few emerging technologies they have, uh, they have forgot to mention. First of all, it's massive censorship which is being implemented with the help of government in Russia. Also, emerging technology of mass surveillance, including facial recognitions. Repressions based on internet posts and up to the internet shutdown, the new emerging technology proposed by sovereign internet legislation. I hope with help of IGF Secretariat the next year, our IGF will be really multi-stakeholder and will be possible to discuss all emerging technologies, all real emerging technologies, as other NRIs are able to discuss. I really like to thank APRGF who came to Vladivostok this year. That was a really multi-stakeholder example of how IGFs uh, are, run out, are running. I would like to thank uh, IGFs of Armenia, Georgia, and Ukraine, where Russian civil society may come and discuss their common problems. Thank you very much. Thank you for your inputs. A right of reply. For the I think I will not uh, allow, first of all, because we're focusing on the emerging technologies. We're not focusing on the nature of the NRIs or anything else that's not focused on the topic. Out of the respect for the work of 120 NRIs that worked for the past nine, nine months very actively on organizing this session, I'm going to kindly ask you to respect their work and allow them to focus this session on the emerging technologies. Quickly, Alexander, you did raise very uh, concerning statements here but I do find them as statements. I don't find them as arguments. The IGF Secretariat does not control any of the NRIs. We collaborate with the NRIs. We carefully look that the principles are respected. And specifically for the Russian IGF, I have to say that our communication was not with one person, not with one organization, but with a multi-stakeholder community gathered around that organization. But it could be, it's highly possible that maybe we don't have the same inputs. So I would take this of this session, our office is of always open to all of you for any kind of discussion related to the NRIs. Thank you very much. Roman, if it's going to be in 20 seconds, yes. If it's going to be more, please. 
Yes, thank you so much, uh, Alexander. Yeah, we know each other, we speak with each other. And uh, first of all, uh, I think I saw you at our forum and uh, I was not one of the organizers, but I was kindly asked to chair and moderate one of the sessions and there were many questions from different uh, multi-stakeholder communities. So I don't see a point in criticizing this nature of the forum and quite vice versa, I invite everybody to come and check because we, I am as a young person, I'm a civil society diplomat, I'm here not representing government, and uh, I am about fact-checking. So that's a good intervention. Everybody is kindly welcome to come and check how we do work in Russia. And of course, I share some of your concerns with regard to the future of internet globally, because really different countries understand internet governance and they uh, make it like, they try to compare it with censorship and something like this. I don't see any censorship in Russia. I think uh, that we can express all our ideas, including your resources, your internet websites are working, you lead several Instagram or Telegram channels, which are also working, and I don't see any reason of uh, such comments. So. Just like, let's join our efforts and try to make it really multi-stakeholder. I'm keen on working with you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Roman. Let's work together exactly. Uh, maybe before I come to you, uh, Jen will speak about the APR IGF. It could have a natural linkage also to the um, Russian IGF and the work they're doing. And then I will come to all of you. But please do direct your inputs to the topic of this session. We worked for, the year, for almost a year on this topic and out of the respect of our co-organizers, please do direct your uh, remarks to the emerging technologies on the national and regional levels. Jen. Thank you, Anya. Uh, my name is Jennifer Chung, I'm part of the Secretariat of the Asia Pacific Regional IGF. I want to thank colleagues actually who've mentioned APRGF several times during this session. Uh, we've heard already from the colleagues um, from Vanuatu IGF, which we had the pleasure of visiting last year. We've heard from the uh, Russian IGF, which had the pleasure of hosting us this year, uh, coinciding with their 10th anniversary and also the 25th anniversary of um, .ru, and they were very, very gracious hosts. And we also had really vibrant discussions, as was mentioned by Alexander and other participants. So we're very happy to do that. I mean, of course, next year we're going to the landlocked state of um, Nepal. So you can see that there's a lot of diversity within the Asia Pacific region. You know, the challenges that we face within the region is so diverse that when you're talking about emerging technologies, it is really the full spectrum. But I will concentrate a little bit more on what was discussed um, this year at Vladivostok. So we talked about the ethics of behind um, computing machines, which is interesting because IGF USA also mentioned that they had this discussion around ethics. Um, for us, it was, um, the discussion was very vibrant. Um, the multidisciplinary approach was critically applied on the training of ethics, and we were talking about how to incorporate it into the education curriculum. Um, we were talking about the accountability of AI lying with a human, and also that ethics is not static. The social norms are changing, um, depending on relevant innovations to the era which is actually questioning these ethics. And another topic we talked about on the emerging technologies is the multi-stakeholder approach for the governance of crypto assets. So this is not a topic that is typically um, discussed so much within APRGF, it's a rather new topic. But because of the characteristics of cryptocurrencies are decentralized, open, peer-to-peer, -peer, and it's, there's free bar entry barriers for um, newcomers, it was very interesting to uh, think about how the governance of this can, can evolve. So there was talk about security incidents um, in the APAC region. It was elaborated that the expected root causes of them was like phishing emails and attack to credentials and so on and so forth. We also uh, received the regulator's perspective from Japan because they recently had the outcome of the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors meeting, um, they were talking about the governance model for blockchain-based financial systems. And they basically set out three major goals, uh, maintaining sta um, financial stability, protecting investors and consumers, and also presenting uh, financial crimes. Um, 
The third topic we talked about on emerging technologies was the IoT security. I think that's something that a lot of colleagues around the table in this room uh, talked about, and of course a lot of NRIs are, are, are interested in. Um, we talked about, particularly from the end user perspective, we received um, some updates from Taiwan. They have a civil IoT project which identified security requirements um, in the IoT ecosystem, along with solutions on how to address these security issues. Um, there was also a very vibrant discussion highlighting around the UNGA resolution um, 68167 um, that states that unlawful and arbitrary surveillance and or interception of communications as well as unlawful or arbitrary collection of personal data as highly intrusive acts violate rights to privacy and to freedom of expression and may contradict the tenets of a democratic society. So there was a very good and vibrant discussion around these tenets as well. And lastly, we talked about how to build a concept of an AI society. So how do we do this for the global good? We talked about the classifications of you, um, AI, how to tackle bias, and the subjective um, interpretations to base it on human need rather than human greed. And we talked about the principles of responsible stewardship of trustworthy AI. Um, and, and how this can play out across national policies and international cooperation for this. Um, lastly, we talked about the challenges in the global cooperation of AI, how it can also improve global healthcare, and how to achieve this, um, the, um, using this AI and also data to achieve the sustainable development goals. And I guess lastly, I would like to invite, I guess, all the colleagues to do come to um, APR at GF next year because we are going to yet another new country, Nepal. Um, so next May in Kathmandu, we welcome all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And we will hopefully see you there in person. If not, then for sure online. We are basically over time. So if colleagues, I would love to allow for all the comments, but if you can be very brief in a few seconds, not more than one minute, to give your inputs. We do have an input from the online participant. Liana, is it a comment or somebody would like to speak? It's just a comment uh, from um, Alexander Ichachayev uh, from North Macedonia. And we had a lovely discussions here about the emerging technologies and universal acceptance, what's happening. And uh, talking about the IDN that they have, uh, and um, the Minister of Administration and Information Society, they're making a massive project on digitalization and bringing, erasing the life of citizen in communication with the state or all other service, social services uh, via internet. The slogan is go digital, and uh, the, um, the government was uh, an active contributor for the last IGF in uh, Macedonia, and we were talking that with this discussion uh, could be in, uh, in different languages, and so that it enables, the new technologies enables everyone to understand uh, like instantly. Uh, so that will be a great uh, advancement of uh, technologies. Thank, thank you very much, Liana, for reading this. Thank you, Alexander, for being online with us from Skopje. So let's go now here to two colleagues, I believe. If you could be very, very brief, because we, there's another main session here, so we have to uh, free the space in the next probably two minutes, the latest. Thank you. You have the floor. Thank you, Chair. I will try to be very brief. Uh, I start with a confession. I, am, I don't represent an NRI. So I'm Sharif from the Maldives. So if you look behind you or in front of you on the big map, you will not find us because we are not there. We are a country where the landmass is 1% of our uh, oceans. So although we are often referred to as a small developing state, we like to think of ourselves as a large ocean developing state. So our challenges are numerous, and we are very inspired. This is the first time we are here at IGF, and we are inspired by what's happening regionally as well as nationally uh, through our IGFs. And we would like, in the coming year 2020, to have our first national IGF, as well as connect with our regional and national partners uh, and global partners. In fact, going to the topic, emerging technologies hold the secret to our survival. We would like to see emerging technologies discussed, especially in the cross-cutting and where did several disciplines touch each other. 
that of food security, that of transport, that of energy security, and that of surviving climate change. So with that, thank you again. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you for inspiring us. And we look forward to be part of this family. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let's please uh, have a chat either today or tomorrow. Maldives are, in general, underrepresented at the IGF in terms of representation. And it would be good that we work on that as well, as well as on forming the national IGF, which is a great news. Thank you very much for excellent comments as well. Yes, <laughs> sorry. Please, if you could have the next comment. I thank you for this opportunity. I will be really brief. So uh, I would like to ask if uh, could be possible to, in order to enhance the ethical standards of uh, development strategies, to enhance the transparencies uh, of uh, mm, so these strategies and uh, be able to participate uh, in order to uh, uh, reduce abuses and 